Hello, my name is Abe, and I'm presenting my paper, Bullrush, a Meal Under the Mire. I don't usually start a presentation by trying to prove how confusing something is, but bullrushes are a bane for many botanists and a nightmare for ethnographers. There are a few understandable reasons for this disdain, so I'll start there. Many bullrush species have close relatives that are challenging to differentiate from one another. For example, the four most common bullrushes in western Washington, where I am, have close lookalikes that share similar habitat. To start with, uh, we have small fruited bulrush or Scirpus microcarpus shown on the left, which has leafy stems with five to 100 small spikelets. And these are features that are very similar to cotton grass bulrush shown on the right or Scirpus cyperinus. And then we have maritime bulrush on the left, uh, Bulboschinus maritimus, which has broadly triangular uh, leafy stems with 5 to 20 fairly large spikelets. And these features are fairly similar to river bulrush, Bulboschinus fluviatilis, uh, shown on the right. And then we have soft stem bulrush, Schinoplectus tabermontanii on the left, which has round leafless stems, just like hard stem bulrush, Schinoplectus acutus, uh, shown on the right. And finally, we have American three square, Schinoplectus americanus, shown on the left which has triangular stems with just a couple leaves and a few flower heads which come off from the side of the stem. And these are features that are just like common three square shown on the right, Schinoplectus pungens. In fact, I had thought that the two last names were actually synonyms for the same plant until I began compiling this research. The second thing that makes bulrushes challenging is that they grow in marshes that are thick with mud, that can pull your boots off and choke you with rotten egg stench. There's often vegetation that can tear up your legs. And if it's a fresh marsh, there's probably mosquitoes and leeches that can suck your blood. Who knows what other dangers lurk in the murk of a marsh? Finally, to make matters worse, both the common names and the scientific names for bulrushes have not only changed frequently over time, but they've also been applied to the wrong species or multiple species. Frankly, understanding bulrush is messy business, both literally and figuratively. But life is messy, and so this is my attempt to make sense of bulrushes. As some of you may know, I'm really interested in indigenous foods. Now, despite the Northwest Coast having a reputation for having very little in the way of carbohydrates, there are actually dozens and dozens of edible root producing species. So this slide shows the 39 species that I've personally tried and photographed. And there are perhaps five to ten other species that are missing from this slide. Unfortunately, many of these species fell out of use really early in the contact period as a result of the introduction of the potato, Solanum tuberosum. This talk will try and sort out the ethnographic record of the edible bulrush species. See if you could find them on the slide. With bulrushes, the old botanical mnemonic, sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses have joints all the way to the ground, doesn't hold the water that those graminoids grow in. As members of the sedge family, or Cyperaceae, many bulrushes have normal triangular cross sections, but a few species actually have round stems that bear a confusing resemblance to, the, uh, to those of the rush family, the Juncaceae. However, there fortunately are a few easily discernible differences. Bulrushes, and sedges in general, have simplified flowers that lack sepals or petals. Instead, there's just a single scale below each flower. Bulrushes also have flowers that only produce a single seed. By comparison, rushes have six tepals, which are um, sepals and petals that look alike, and uh, they surround a capsule that contains multiple seeds. So if you look closely, there are some easy differences. As far as I know, the edible bulrushes are limited to just two genera, Schinoplectus and Bulboschinus. These genera have been split from the otherwise inedible genus Scirpus by most modern botanists, a treatment which suits me because their botanical differences have some real world meaning and I think some ethnographic meaning. The closely related genus Cyperus is also edible, but usually specified as chufa or nut sedge, and so I'm not gonna cover it in this presentation. So I don't have time to describe the distinguishing features of each of the species that I am gonna talk about, but for a full treatment, you can see my paper um, under the same title in the summer 2020 issue of Deglossia, the Journal of the Washington Native Plant Society. 
Many of the early accounts I review in this talk use the common name Thule. Thule usually refers to the taller Schenoplectus species, such as soft stem, hard stem, and California bulrushes, although confusingly, it is sometimes attributed to cattails, typha species, which are in a totally different plant family, the Typhaceae. The word Thule evidently comes from the Aztec word Tulin or Tolin uh, for aquatic bulrushes, a word that was first adopted by the Spanish in Mexico and later by English speaking Americans. Now, if using a twice borrowed common name for multiple species in two different plant families wasn't befuddling enough, um, horsetails or uh, scouring rushes, Equicetum species, are also confused in the ethnographic record under the common name rush uh, by people like James Swan and Myron Eels. And then occasionally indigenous groups used the, um, the same name for multiple species. And Nancy Turner documented this with uh, horsetail and scouring rush, which um, both use the same indigenous term. Um, in her, in, she documented this in her Thompson Ethnobotany. So the similarities between bulrushes, cattails, and horsetails are numerous. Bulrushes, cattails, and horsetails all grow in wetlands. They all have spongy, linear uh, stems that can be used in weaving, and several of them have edible tubers or rhizomes. Now to the ethnographic literature for bulrushes. While traveling in the Columbia River watershed in Oregon and Washington in the early 1820s, the pioneering botanist David Douglas observed that the tender white shoots of a four to 10 foot tall species of bulrush, making it either soft stem or hard stem bulrush, were eaten and, quote, considered a luxury, end quote. The sprouts of an undetermined species are also traditionally eaten by the Puyallup and Nisqually in Washington, as documented by uh, Smith in 1930. Other early ethnographic records come from Edward S. Curtis, the famous ethnographic photographer and the author of the 20-volume series, The North American Indian. Curtis had some knowledge of the various bulrushes, and he frequently documented the use of both Thule and cattail making it possible to be sure that he was differentiating the species in his accounts. As if he were aware of the potential for confusion, he also occasionally includes the scientific names for cattail and heart stem bulrush. In California, he observed the tender white central shoot of hard stem bulrush being eaten fresh by the um, Toloa, Tatuni, and Lake Pomo. And he described Thule as a, quote, fairly important food, end quote, to the Valley Maidu. He also recorded indigenous terms for uh, edible tule shoots among the eastern and central Pomo and tule pit among the Wapu and the Wiat. And then Welch documented the consumption of the raw young shoots of sturdy bulrush. And in Utah, the young shoots of hard stem bulrush are also traditionally eaten by the Gassiute of, um, of Utah, as documented by Chamberlain in 1911. The roots of bulrushes are also traditionally eaten by many other indigenous groups. Accounts from northern groups are unfortunately ambiguous, and I'll start there. The inland Denaina uh, eat the thick underground tuber of a large sedge that is described as looking like the bulb of an onion in Russell's 2012 work, and this is probably a bulrush. Um, Steedman, working with the notes of the botanist and ethnographer James Tate, noted that the the thick fleshy um, rootstocks of one bulrush species were roasted and eaten by the Nnaklakpamukh. The roots of a kind of rush were eaten by the Twaina, uh, Chemakam, Klalam, and other Native Americans in the Puget Sound, as documented by uh, Swan and Eels. And they could be talking about a bulrush or perhaps a cattail or horsetail. And the Quinault considered a bulrush species to be among their uh, principal root foods, and they steam cooked it, according to Curtis. The ethnographic record is better in the Southwest. The early botanist Robert Brown observed the use of hard stem bulrush rhizomes in California in the 1860s, and Harvard claimed that it was widely eaten along the Pacific states in his 1895 publication. Curtis also documented Thule use among many groups in Western North America, including the Shasta, the Chomoe, uh, Tolowa, Northern Wintoon, and Valley Potwin, Valley Maidu, Diaguino, and Hoopa. He elaborates that the fresh rhizomes were, quote, esteemed, end quote, by the Mono and Paviazzo, 
and that the, quote, core of the underground stocks were eaten raw, end quote, by the Mono. The Yokuts, quote, depended mainly on tule roots. The dried root of tule were, were roasted, pulverized, and formed into balls, which were baked in hot ashes, where the flour might be cooked into mush, end quote. The Tumash also ate the rhizomes this way, or raw, according to Timbrook. The gray literature provides some other useful details. In 1921, a 10-year-old girl made news for her presentation of Shasta indigenous foods at the California State Fair. She was quoted saying, the Native Americans pull tule roots early in the spring while they are young and tender. They also dry them for winter use, end quote. Another participant observer account comes from Thomas Jefferson Mayfield, who was adopted by a band of the Yokuts and lived with them for a decade in the 1850s. He provides exceptional detail about the use of tule. Quote, they ate great quantities of young tule roots, which were soft and sweet. The Lake Indians made an almost pure starch from tule. The rhizomes were placed in a large cooking basket and were covered with hot water. The mixture was stirred with a long looped stirring stick for an hour or so. Then the rush roots were raked out and thrown away. In an hour or two, the starch had settled to the bottom of the basket. The water was then poured off and they obtained in this way a cake of starch two inches in thickness. I don't have time to get into the details, but bulrushes also have some other interesting edible parts, including the seeds, pollen, and most surprisingly, a sugar that is excreted when the stems are attacked by aphids, and the sugar was collected by Native Americans in the Southwest and used as a sweetener. In summary, many bulrush species have edible rhizomes or tubers. Indigenous use of these roots is documented throughout the Pacific Northwest, but the reports are often vague and can sometimes be difficult to attribute to a particular species. Through my personal experimentation with four species of bulrush, I found the flavor of the roots to range from dessert-like sweetness in bulbous genus to sustaining starchiness in Chernoplectus. But despite the fine flavor present in bulbous genus, this was the most difficult genus to parse out in the ethnographic record. Thank you. That concludes my presentation, and here are some of the sources I reference.